All right, so thanks to Nate for giving a very admirable uh, Jane Ask overview um, on, the, on the California Energy Future Study. I'm gonna uh, start with where he left off, which is this question of the now infamous ZEL, zero energy load balancing. Um, I think what's interesting in, in preparing for this, I realized how much that dialogue had matured over the five years since we produced the study in 2011. Um, and hopefully what I'll say will then lead into what Doug and, and Chris and others will, will uh, expand upon as we go through the, the rest of the morning. So we looked at this challenge of trying to reconcile the variable supply of electricity under a highly renewable scenario, um, one that was at least 33% and perhaps more in some of the portraits that we looked at with the demand that would be required in this California of the future in 2050. And, and we looked at the possibility that these imbalances were gonna be significant enough to, to really challenge the operation of the energy system. We didn't go into the operations. Doug and Chris are gonna talk about that and we've done a lot more work since then. But we sort of stayed at the high level and said, if we're gonna make this work, we need one of three things under this banner of of ZELB. Either we need, and we started here with flexible generation, and in terms of flexible generation, we were really thinking about natural gas. And how would natural gas factor into the system circa 2050 in a world that was lower carbon in nature? And where, where we actually ended up putting the ZE on top of this was a realization that with all the natural gas turbines we were gonna need to balance the electricity supply, we were actually gonna blow the carbon cap. So we then started thinking, okay, how do you get flexible generation onto the system in ways that are zero emissions? And so it ran the gamut from thermal storage alongside concentrated solar plants, to uh, biofuels that ran diesel gensets, to natural gas actually created from excess renewables, what we now know as the, the, the head and the butt of the duck, and how do you scoop that peak power now and create hydrogen or renewable natural gas that could be stored to support this, this flexibility in generation. And even now, some of the work that we're doing at NREL and elsewhere, we start burrowing down into the operations in a highly renewable future we're seeing a lot of CTs coming on at the morning, sun up and sun down. And they're there for only a couple of hours a day, but they're still significant in terms of their future carbon emissions. So this question of flexible generation was, was sort of a, a, a big deal. We looked at, you know, could we run gas with CCS in a very flexible mode? Well, I can tell you from my own work in the CCS area, the last thing you wanna do with current carbon capture and storage capability is flex it up and down. Uh, you get enormous uh, degradation in the efficiency. So that would be an R&D gap that we would later put out uh, as a, uh, a worthy one in the paper. So all sorts of things in, in, the, in the set of studies related to flexible generation. Right, second that we looked at, you know, so this, if this was kind of a, a, a lesser starter because of the emissions requirements and the need to manage those, the second one we looked at was, en was energy storage. Um, and, and here, the thing that stuck in my mind was what we ended up calling the gigawatt day problem. Meaning that if we had an, an enormous amount of wind in the Central Valley of California, or we had all of Southern California covered in solar panels, and we got, as we typically do, I've lived in California most of my life, you get these high pressure systems that bring the low cloud onshore. You suddenly have a gigawatt of capacity that's out of order for over a day. And so where were we gonna find the gigawatt day worth of energy storage that we would be able to use in order to balance the system and keep the lights on? So we looked at compressed air and pumped hydro, and we established that the geology in California allowed for some air, compressed air energy storage, particularly in the fossil reservoirs in the Central Valley, but probably not enough there. We looked at pumped hydro, and we talked about all the pumped hydro available in these Sierras, but under future climate scenario, were the hydro resources gonna be what we thought they were gonna be? And so there were limitations there as well. Uh, we then moved on to batteries, 
Uh, and yet Ming talked about it in his opening uh, introductions about battery technologies evolving, emerging, probably not going to be enough. Certainly wasn't the case in 2011 when we were looking at sodium sulfur, lithium ion, and we were more in the you know, $500 to $1,000 range as opposed to the $100 per kilowatt range where we're trying to move our R&D programs now. And could we really have that many batteries to provide a gigawatt day worth of capacity or more? Uh, as we envision might be needed in the out years. So, so this was a question, whereas flexible generation was one about staying within the emissions cap, the storage question was within the economic cap. You know, were, were we going to be able to achieve our storage outcomes in a way that, that seemed cost effective, uh, even as we looked out into uh, redox and flow battery technologies that were emerging on the horizon? I think even now, the conversations I'm privy to at DOE are, are really challenging some of the notions of what we can do with battery R&D, and I know we're going to get into that later. Can I clarify a question? What were the assumptions about the imports? So we assumed at the outset that California was going to live in a world where everybody else was trying to do the same thing. So we, d we sort of to first order neglected the opportunity to cheat by importing renewable energy from other states. <laughs> very good, uh, very good. We the can into yeah. else's problem, and we decided we were going to try to make California in this model the globe, multiplying whatever factor you wanted, so we didn't let any imports happen. Yeah, that's, that's great, and I'm glad you brought that up, because early on we said, okay, it's easy enough, we'll just cover all the state of Nevada and solar panels and go home. Right. Um, but, but we explicitly pulled that out. Larger regional studies, the kinds that Doug and Chris are going to talk about, uh, relax that requirement, but I don't think it does you any favors, to be honest. So third element, then, was looking at demand. So this is something where, at least in recent years, I've become more excited about. You know, there's lots of great work going on in R&D here, lots of great work going on in R&D here, but I think where we've really moved the needle in the last five years is looking at the demand side. Um, how do you manage the demand shapes so that they match the supply rather than saying, how are we going to curtail or otherwise modify the supply to meet the available demand? So during the course of the study, we looked at everything from curtailment to demand response for peak to time of use. Uh, even into things like energy management on the level of a system. And I think of the four, that's the area where there's been a lot more focus on things like microgrids, on home energy management systems, on community energy systems now. If I have a, a cul-de-sac of homes with PV on the rooftop and demands that are responsive to various signals, can I somehow modify on a smaller scale the, the demand and the load shapes in such a way that I can balance at all levels. I'll give you an example of this. We've been running some experiments in my facility where we've got a pool pump attached to a smart home, and we've modeled that in the lab, and we're actually using real-time pricing data and grid conditions to drive that set of, of items. This pool pump is a, one of the first appliances that is the Demand Response Energy Star certified. So it, it's actually Energy Star for demand, as opposed to Energy Star for efficiency. Uh, and what it does is it knows that based on the volume of the water that it's circulating, it has a certain energy burden, right? It needs you know, X kilowatt hours to do a complete cycle. And if the consumer says, I want my pool filtered once every 48 hours, right? Then the pump is smart enough to know when I need to use that X kilowatt hours within that 48 hour cycle, I can look at the day ahead or the hourly ahead market prices. I can look at the meteorological conditions. You know, is the PV panel on site producing or am I going to have to pull from the grid? Um, what else is going on? Are they running the dishwasher or is there an air conditioning load that's running? And well, maybe that's not the time to, to run so that I don't cause a peak charge. There's a, there's a series of really what I think are elegant solutions that allow us to manage and monitor our load shapes to meet the available renewable resources. And if you think if we can do that at the level of a home or, or a building, now we can start doing that in a campus or in a community, and we can start to create flexibility within the grid system itself. Uh, and, and so that's an area where I've seen a lot of of growth and thought and, and opportunity, and I, and I hope that, that we'll get into that. So, so this is where we were sort of relative to 2011. 
Uh, since that time, I'll add two other things that we're doing uh, from, a, from a DOE perspective. One is what we call grid modernization, and I know Sonia is going to get into that uh, in her conversation, uh, but as the uh, co-chair of the DOE Grid Modernization Lab Consortium, I would be remiss if I didn't bring this up. Um, we've moved from, you know, sort of demand response in terms of price signals to things like power electronics that allow to buffer the production of the PV panel that go right behind the panel on the roof or active power controls on the wind turbines that provide frequency response or ramping capability. We've even now demonstrated with one of our projects in Puerto Rico, a 200 megawatt utility solar plant providing frequency regulation and ramp up, ramp down. So that some of the operational concerns that were uh, implicit here in flexible generation, we've now obviated with the way in which we're managing the renewable resources themselves. That's zero energy load balancing because we're using that zero energy re or zero emissions resource to, to balance the grid, uh, including forecasting, scheduling, dispatch, uh, new power controls and inverters, uh, even thinking about transmission, which is something Chris will uh, talk to uh, in, a, in a few moments. Uh, so there's a lot of, of, of tools in the toolkit now that go beyond what we indicated in the, um, in the California Energy Futures Study. And then the last thing I'll highlight, and this gets to Nate's comment about industry, light, uh, excuse me, medium and heavy duty transport, uh, we're really now starting to take a renewed look at hydrogen. As you recall, 10 years ago, we looked at hydrogen as a light duty vehicle fuel, and for a variety of reasons, infrastructure, cost, et cetera, we sort of set that to the wayside. That's coming back around now when we think about the opportunity to use the proton instead of the electron, and where we have overgeneration in renewables, as we're now seeing to be a big challenge in areas where they're penetrating quickly. How do we use that overgeneration to create basically a, a relatively low cost fuel? in the form of hydrogen and then push that into places where you need a really energy dense fuel but you don't want it to come from a carbon resource. So manufacturing, steel, chemicals, petro, uh, petrochemical feedstock replacements, um, you can get it from a variety of resources, bio, uh, fossil with CCS through the Syngas, you can get it from nuclear, as Pear well knows, and we've done some work there on the, the economics and the feasibility of doing that. Um, whereas this is a current, what we call big idea within the DOE uh, effort for R&D, and we've doubled the, the federal investment in grid over the last couple of years. This hydrogen at scale is the next one up for bids, uh, and it's working through its budget processes now, and I can speculate that this will be a big recommendation into the next administration for where we put our energy R&D. So we started with kind of three simple concepts. We've now got a very nice constellation of opportunities, uh, but all comes back to how do we manage this flexibility that we're gonna need in the future energy system without incurring any extra carbon so we don't blow the budget. So we'll stop there. <laughs>